Hello and welcome to episode number 261 of the Armin Show podcast. On this show, we have all the cool people in this case. We have Emma Rose Bienvenue. How did I find Emma Rose? But first, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. You know it. How did I find Emma? I found her through an article that she wrote. Content is very important. If you connect with people through your material, you're using the internet right. Now, Emma, before we get into the article, how is your day? And tell us what you do. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, my day is as well as a day can be going in quarantine. Uh, thrilled to speak to you. Um, I have a pretty diverse background, uh, mainly kind of at the intersection of law and finance. Um, so I got a bunch of degrees before starting to work. I have an undergrad that I did at Small School in Paris and at Georgetown. Um, I have a master's in economics. Um, I have a master in law from UPenn and Wharton. Um, and then I have a JD in DCL from McGill here in Canada. So it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so as you can imagine, my work experience has been pretty diverse. I worked in telecom in Hong Kong for a while. I worked at a couple of the big pension funds in Canada, uh, so at PSP and at CDPQ. These are big, like $300 billion funds that do a really wide variety of investments. They're great. Um, and then I worked uh, most recently at law firms. Um, so I was at Linklater's in London and at McCarthy, a firm in Canada. This is cool. Now, how early, this is always a curiosity of mine. How early in your life did you see this path to where you are currently? Was there a shift at some point? Yeah, so I, mean, I think that... <laughs> The law one, I think, was always fairly clear. Um, I'm really interested in what we owe each other as people, and also, you know, the constraints, like the guardrails that are put on people's behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think my interest in business and economics came from sort of what is in those guardrails, right? So the incentives and stuff that you have in markets and that are framed by the law. So I always, I mean, I was a high school and college debater, so I think that was fairly clear. But um, yeah, economics came later in life. This debate element is a key element of law. It's also a certain personality type. One of my, in Myers-Briggs ENTP, which I am, they have somewhat of a debate yeah. sense. Do you know your Myers-Briggs? I'm ENTP. Okay, we're two ENT, really? Yeah. Okay, let's go. Okay, you want to debate then? All right, Emma Rose, bienvenue. I'm right about this, this, and this, okay? Uh, watch out, I'm right about everything. <laughs> oh my gosh, we should include. I'm gonna my, predictions. my predictions may, may turn out to, uh, who knows, right? They're long off, but I feel pretty good about them. <laughs> They have no chance, okay? I'm going to debate everything now, okay? We're straight battle on this one. Kidding. That's cool, though. That makes sense. Did you, have you done any form of, like, comedy, that category of this personality type, or not at all? No, I don't think no. I'm secure enough to do comedy. I need to know I'm right. <laughs> oh, okay. That one's more, there's more of a risk involved. Yeah. It's not certain. So, that's cool. I like to know that personality is very important to me. I'm very focused on it in mindset. Now, that's in Canada. Did you have any inclinations to uh, work in certain places from early on? Were there any people you wanted to work with that you imagined yeah. at the forefront? And what have you brought to the legal field? Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, my, I came from a family of lawyers. So I think the, I always saw myself doing uh, what I ended up doing, which was international law. Mm -hmm. um, and so mainly I focused on international arbitration and international investment law. Mm -hmm. um, as far as my contributions to the field, I mean, I, so I worked at the International Chamber of Commerce in New York uh, on international arbitration um, and have also published quite a bit um, articles uh, and uh, in the textbook recently, one of them. Um, and so, you know, I think I've, I've contributed in that sense, but I think on a softer level, I think my unique background being both economics and business and law and an understanding of finance um, makes me a much stronger contributor in those environments, right? So in London with Linklater's, I was working on banking and private equity. And then at CDPQ, I was working on synthetic derivatives. Those are both two things that are very hard for lawyers to understand. Um, and so it's good to be able to translate to you know, the bankers and to the other lawyers in the team what is actually going on. Mm -hmm. You pointed that out, that was nice. I checked that you were in a book in a blurb, if you will, from a page, another page and a half of your material. What was that material? And do you plan to be in more books? <laughs> Definitely. Um, the material that was published was in the uh, law school textbook for international investment law. It was a piece I wrote uh, while I was at UPenn getting my LLM um, about 
this is a little little niche, but I'll walk you through it. Niche um, is great. There's only specificities <laughs> in life. That's all we have. Yeah, exactly. Um, so there is a mechanism for resolving international disputes called international arbitration. So if I am, let's say, Coca-Cola, and I want to build a factory in Zimbabwe, um, I have a few reservations, right? So first of all, I'm concerned that the court system there doesn't really treat me fairly, right? Second of all, I'm concerned maybe I'll build my factory and then, though I have nothing against the government of Zimbabwe, a government could expropriate, right? They could come in with their army and tanks and steal it and there's nothing I could do. Now, Zimbabwe knows that that's a concern for companies, so also has an incentive to find a way to make them trust that their investments will be safe. So what they came up with is investment treaties signed between, it can be either two first world countries, a first world country and a third world country or any mix thereof, um, that state that if you invest in my country and you have any reason that you think you've been treated unfairly, we're gonna set up essentially a private court. So Coca-Cola and Zimbabwe, I'm simplifying things, but would nominate two judges and then those two judges pick third judge and then that panel of three people does like a trial but in you know an office building in London. <laughs> um, and so it's this mechanism that's very flexible. And then once the, once the court case is done, they disband. So that flexible mechanism has been kind of widely proliferated in all the investment treaties and provide investors with the certainty that they've needed to create the flows of foreign investment that have increased you know, wildly over the past uh, couple of decades. So that's what I, what I look at. Um, there's been some backlash against that obviously because the result is often you know if coca-cola wins you have three people that are just private citizens right they're called judges but really they're not um who are awarding huge amounts of money paid by poor governments to private corporations so it's controversial um but i work about that my article was about whether we should move away from that to adopt a permanent court system for the world <laughs> um or whether the and they're, they're, Europe has tried to do that a couple of times. Um, and, you know, what the, the relative advantages and disadvantages there are. Hmm. One thing that comes to mind right there, whenever there's an international conflict or issue, who do you deviate towards? Which country or how do you pick who? I mean, I think, yeah, that's great. As a native Canadian, I mean, I'm biased. <laughs> um, look, I, I, no country's perfect, right? I think, I think a lot of good work is being done in Europe right now around some of the, I wouldn't say it's a conflict, but I think they're very smart about tech regulation. They're, I mean, it's not perfect, right? I, there are many of their laws are a little clunky, but I think they've been ahead of the curve on that. They had the GDPR recently for data protection um, and they're now moving on to the uh, security of networked objects, which is a huge problem and, and they're tackling it pretty effectively. They're great on antitrust enforcement too. Hmm. Have you been to Europe? What has been your travels? Have you been to different regions? What have you taken from different regions? Yeah, so I actually lived in France for about four years. Um, I got one of my graduate degrees there um, and half of my undergraduate degree um, in Paris. Uh, and I mean, France is wonderful. It's a very civilized country. It was interesting. I moved to Hong Kong immediately after living in France and was struck by, there's a certain pessimism in France, right? They they, I think they're aware that their best days may be behind them. Mm -hmm. um, and in Hong Kong, there was this kind of like animal will to win and this, you know, certainty that like the next 200 years are ours. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, that was a really interesting contrast. Uh, I've lived in London, which I loved. The Brits are some of my favorite people. Um, interestingly, like unique culture, though, I think there's a tendency when you're from North America, when you go to London, you know, it looks a lot like North America and people speak English. So you assume it's the same. Whereas it's not, it's very different. The, uh, you know, Americans are much more straightforward. Brits kind of imply what they mean. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've loved all the places I've lived. I lived in the States too. I was in DC, uh, Philadelphia, when yeah. I was in. and New York most recently, sorry. <laughs> Shout outs to New York, which I went to recently. <laughs> last guest, Shan, uh, a recent guest is from New York and a doctor also there. One thing that comes to mind is that's a really good message you provide. The country feels a certain way based on our years are behind us versus like Hong Kong, our years are ahead. The view is felt by all the people if things are like, where was your adversity? Where was your difficulty? If it has happened now, later, great things will come. If it was then, good things may have come and then you get spoiled after a while. You're too comfortable. <laughs> too comfortable. One thing that comes to mind is countries have periods of effectiveness or momentum. 
And in the same way, have you had moments in your life where there were little bits of adversity that led to effectiveness later on? What were some key moments in your existence? Yeah, definitely. Um, I spent a lot of time in school uh, mm -hmm. and grad school in particular. I, I did two back-to-back -back, um, grad school programs, one in economics and finance and the other in uh, corporate and international law. Those were really tough programs, as anyone that's been to grad school knows, um, and at times it felt long. <laughs> but uh, the, right after that, I was working at uh, Linklater's in London, um, say the law firm in business and private equity. And it was a coming together of all the groundwork that had been laid, right, and seeing that the training in finance and economics allowed me to be a go-between with the business teams and the, and the lawyers. It was, it was a wonderful period. Makes sense. We never forget these high emotional momentum moments in our existence. Mm -hmm. I am the super duper at some form of segues. One came to mind is you like Dr. David Sinclair. I like Dr. David Sinclair. I've spoken with said individual. He has been posting a lot about the current thing, which is a pandemic. Your article is about this pandemic. It is called, wonderful article, by the way, shout outs to people who write stuff and make material. Seven predictions for a post coronavirus world. You can tell you put thought and research into it because it's detailed. If you don't put thought and research into an article, it can't, it doesn't, it just can't be this way. I've just noticed that you can't just write a random article and it comes out great. So uh, it's about remote work, automation, and telemedicine becoming the new normal, among others. Is this, are you going to be writing articles more often before we get into it? Yeah. I mean, as I think everyone's experienced quarantine, can be draining <laughs> and I literally just put pen to paper because in this instance I you know had been consuming so much content and wanted to clarify my own thoughts and it was only after that I decided to write it I think so I mean it's certainly more rewarding to write an article like this than than in a law journal where it gets read 10 times my articles now have been read almost half a million times um, so it's gotten wildly uh, you know more distribution than I expected uh, but yeah I, I expect I will I mean certainly at least until quarantine ends Makes sense. Medium shared it. Everybody's sharing it. It's great material. Let's look at some of the reasons, uh, concepts you have listed there. So first one, companies that traffic in digital services and e-commerce will make immediate and lasting gains. This makes sense. They have been set up for it. One previous guest, Shan, he's done remote work for years. So his e-commerce and or ad advertising business will do just fine in this moment. Uh, what kind of services will take off? What comes to mind in this category? Yeah, so I mean, I think this one is kind of the most obvious and probably most intuitively short term, but I actually think will outlast the crisis. So I mean, when you know we're all quarantined and away from other people, businesses that don't need to come into physical contact with you are going to thrive, right? I mean, it's kind of kind of obvious. But I think the more profound point is that a lot of what we have to change during the period of social isolation is going to make people discover new things that they didn't hadn't tried before or change their buying habits in a way they actually like. And then those gains are going to last even after social isolation ends or after we find a vaccine. So I think there's a few categories of, of companies there that should expect to do really well. Obvious ones are, you know, e-commerce, Amazon, that kind of thing. Um, I think any delivery service, right, logistics companies are going to do well. And then I, I mean, the, my shorthand for it is companies that traffic in bits and boxes, right? So anything that's online, bits, and boxes is, you know, people to get things to you without you having to go to a store. So on, on the bit side, I think you have, um, obviously, uh, you know, so, well, social media companies, I think it's actually wrong to expect that they're going to win as a result of this. You've seen advertising revenue plummet um, across social media companies. So even though traffic is soaring, I think they're going to have a really tough time because their advertiser revenue is going to be so depressed. Um, and then I think that cascades down to, you know, advertising companies, PR, marketing, all of those, when there just isn't a lot of demand for products and people aren't buying them, companies start to pull, to pull their advertisements. Um, so, and then finally, I think things like esports are going to do really well. People are going to try it that wouldn't have otherwise tried it, and they're going to keep doing it after the crisis. Um, I think at home workouts, people are discovering that they actually don't need to spend half an hour getting to their gym and then back, right? That they can just do it in their own home. Um, and then I think obviously everyone that traffics in remote medicine is going to do really well. This is true. A lot of adaptations we had been developing, talking about for the past year and a half, two years ish, just got fast forwarded very quickly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of the predictions, I think 
are better understood as accelerations than as changes that I'm predicting, right? Most of this stuff was already kind of clawing along and we already had the ability to do them. But I think the crisis is just gonna accelerate that. You know, what would have taken a decade is gonna take six months. I agree with that. It's not like something that we didn't want to happen is now occurring other than the somewhat non-preference of social activity, but the <laughs> general trajectory, it's like we, we had to kind of thing. Esports is a big one. 20 years ago, if you played video games, no good. 10 years ago, you were part of many people that played. Now, definitely has a moment as a, like a, com a competitor to sports in a way. Yeah, exactly. I think you're going to start seeing, I mean, esports largely used to be understood as a category as like video games, as you say, but I think what's going to be more and more prevalent is a real fan base and teams that are known and, you know, people that really tune in to watch the games and follow seasons and stuff. I think it's going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, you also spoke about remote work will become the default. A lot of a certain subset of individuals are able to go directly to remote work. How much will go to remote work? and what will be unable to be remote worked. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there's some things that are always gonna require, always, who knows, but at least in the medium term will require like haircuts and you know all that kind of things that are not essential workers, but that do need a person to be there and everyone needs them. I think those will, you know, obviously hum along. I think that anyone that, you know, goes to work and spends their time on a computer um, is going to be given the option going forward to not come in. And I think that has really interesting cascading effects, right? I think when you don't need to be close to a city, you know, you can move to some lower cost area and have a better space to work from home. When you don't need to go to a city, you see congestion levels drop and commercial real estate, you know, is also gonna suffer when companies realize that they don't need a workspace to accommodate 100% of their workers every day. I also think um, remote technology is gonna improve, right? I think you're gonna get better tools I think VR has huge potential for, you know, mingling. You can do a VR happy hour and feel almost like the real thing. Um, and I also think that you're going to see even, so especially in the medium term, right, where you can't have factories at full capacity, but you still need things to be produced. I think you're going to see a really quick and really uh, far reaching innovation in manufacturing. So, you know, you could have a forklift operator wearing a VR headset and operating his forklift from his home. Um, and I think because some critical industries need that to happen, right, like food production and all that, you can't have as many people along the assembly line, but it needs to happen. I think the technology will develop and then after the crisis happens, will proliferate to other industries. Mm -hmm. One thing I like about uh, remote is that it's almost, somebody talked about this a year ago, that people could just live in pods in some <laughs> random city that is not expensive. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, totally. I think another thing that's, I mean, I appreciate about remote work is that if you commute for, you know, 45 minutes, let's say both ways, and you take an hour for lunch and you're not that efficient because people pop into your office, your workday ends up being really compressed, right? The actual work you do when you're in an office, I mean, speaking for myself, is not, you know, eight, 10 hours, however long you're spending at the office. It's actually much less than that. So I think there's tremendous potential to make the time we spend working more efficient and just cut off the frictions on both ends and really come out a bit better off. That's true. The first thing that comes to mind when you say that is Japan, where it's like the work day and going to work regardless of if you're doing work and working hard kind of, but not yeah. really producing much. <laughs> There's sort of like these expectations or a, a framework around it, but it wasn't actually about the thing. It was just right. the time. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It doesn't have that weight. The debt crisis. You talked about the student debt crisis and how it might be impacted by this moment. Where does education go? Yeah, so I think there's been a lot of, I mean, there's been a lot of feedback from this article in comments and debates in the comments section. And I think some people misunderstood my point on this one. Um, Let's set them straight. <laughs> my prediction is not that universities are going to disappear mm -hmm. and go fully online. And my belief is not that online education is more effective than in-person education. I think it can be in certain contexts, but I certainly don't think that's always the case or even the norm. My point is that the costs of university as set up currently don't work. The economics of it don't work. People can't pay back that much money and it doesn't seem like it is cost benefit worth it, 
right? There are so many people who take on this debt or maybe pay it off until they're you know, 45 and never buy a home, right? If you're spending $250,000 to get a degree, right? It is unsustainable. And so I think, you know, though if it were sustainable, it might be better to learn in person. I think by necessity, many universities are going to move portions of their curriculum online to cut costs. I really think that's gonna be the motivation. Um, and I think that's particularly the case because many less competitive universities receive most of their funding from state governments who are going to come out of this crisis with their finances absolutely cratered. Uh, state governments get most of their income from uh, right, taxing their local residents and sales taxes. And um, those people aren't buying anything. So they're, uh, and massive layoffs, they're also responsible for unemployment benefits. So states are gonna be hitting costs wherever they can. And I think online learning is gonna be somewhere they're gonna go first. What are aspects of learning that cannot be put online? What are the things that come to mind there? I, I would say it's, um, it's very student dependent, right? I think that there are some students that would really thrive with online learning and doing it at their own pace and at a time that's convenient to them. I think there's others that find it difficult to focus and right? I think things like seminars, if you, you know, do a fuzzy undergraduate degree like I did that's on political science and philosophy, I think seminars are really valuable and it's hard just for us as humans to be as engaged when it's happening over the internet. I think, um, you know, I've sat in many lecture halls with 400 people. I don't derive much value from not being in person. I think I'd be better suited doing it from my couch. <laughs> mm -hmm. But oh no, the PowerPoints, as they go through them, is that not endearing? No? I mean, you don't PowerPoint on the internet. That's true, that's a good point. I had to somewhat comment on that, but that was like the default. I think that's still the default, good old PowerPoints. Now, <laughs> Speaking of, actually, you took, a, you said philosophy and a fuzzy degree-ish. Did you connect with any philosophers? Are there any philosophies you take into account on a daily basis? Because I always look at mindset as well. Oh, that's a loaded question. I like Nozick a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, I like Locke. <laughs> I generally like philosophers that, you know, I, I don't like any, like, Kantianism. I don't think that, you know, the, having categorical imperatives is useful. Um, so I'm like a, you know, Bentham, I'm a utilitarian for sure. Um, but, uh, I like philosophers that tend to also be economists. So, oh, yeah. there's a little bit of like a assessment of the value and the demand of what they put yeah. out. Oh, Look, things are happening out here. <laughs> I include every element of reality in every episode because reality happens at all times. <laughs> Great to know. Yeah. Now I also like, uh, yeah, various thinkers and their works. I like the Marcus Aurelius meditations and some other. That. Yeah, it's a classic. I actually reread that one every couple of years. You do? Yeah. That's well. It's good to reread books. It's different the second time. Or it third. Is, yeah. Goods and people will move less often and less freely across national and regional borders. Countries will retreat into themselves. What will happen within the next, let's say, a few years? What do you see in here? Yeah. So, I mean, this is unfortunate. I'm very much a globalist and, and I would always prefer more internationalism, but I think it's fairly inevitable that the immediate response to this is going to be isolationist. And I think that's true for practical reasons and for just kind of human political reasons. So practically speaking, I think particularly in sort of the next year or two, you inevitably have to really tightly control borders. If, you know, a region or country is having any amount of success and they want to reopen part of their economy, right, because people are struggling so much with the shutdown, they're going to have to close their borders. There's really no other way uh, until we get, you know, a vaccine or, or effective treatment. So I think for practical reasons, borders are going to shut and that's going to limit just travel, trade, and generally like interconnections. I think, I think from a political, like human kind of emotion standpoint, I think when you have this, you know, enemy essentially, right, this is essentially a war against a viral enemy that comes in, I think your tendency is to want to protect your group and retreat into your own group. And we're seeing that politically, right? You're seeing right-wing politicians really kind of get a surge here. Um, and I think that's gonna continue, particularly as the economy, you know, continues to, to struggle to say the least. And as uh, mass unemployment, you know, makes everyone just generally very anxious and fearful. And I think that anxiety and fear tends to drive the isolationist impulses. Now, one thing you mentioned there, you are, uh, you have a global view what are we losing by not having more of a global connection between countries? We're losing a ton. So, I mean, I can answer that 
politically and kind of culturally and then also just I would like both yeah so from a business perspective I mean the the choice companies have made in the past decades have been really efficiency driven right so they have globalized their supply chains because the country that can produce a thing most efficiently or with the lowest labor costs should do that right and if you can globalize your supply chain you'll get the lowest cost or the highest quality or both um but there's a trade-off to efficiency right which is resilience and the supply chains that are you know in many places at once if you cut off one part of that chain your supply chain then has to be reordered and that is really fragile right and i think companies have seen that they had like overly optimized their supply chains such that they were super vulnerable to a shock. And this particular shock has been really kind of a calamity. Um, I think countries, so, so we're losing efficiency by not having that, but I think reshoring will make economies more resilient. Um, I think being reliant on each other is a good way to make countries kind of have a stake in everything going well for everyone, right? If a war breaks out in China, the US companies that rely on that are going to suffer. and that's true of kind of any conflict, right, where you have a stake. So I think the fact that we will have less of a stake in global stability is probably a bad thing, um, right, like less of an incentive to care. And then I also think, I mean, personally, I love to travel. Uh, I, I expect that even after the crisis, you're going to have much stricter, I think we're going to look back and think that we took it for granted that we could just kind of travel to any country with a passport, you know, in a quick visa process. I think you're going to see biometric screening. I think at least in the short term, you're going to see mandatory quarantines in a lot of areas and just a, just a whole series of like really strong frictions to travel that decrease all kinds of travel. Mm -hmm. Made me think of Nicholas Nassim Taleb and his book, Skin in the Game. If you don't have skin in the game, it's just not going to pull at you in the way that if you're invested, you have something that you have to yeah, do. Exactly. One thing you added there, I like, by the way, the resilience versus efficiency. I like that concept because you have to give up one for the other in a way. Right. Countries, as far as globalization, will also perform some form of intrusive surveillance. How is surveillance going to be impacted by this moment? For yeah. Us? I mean, so I think you're already seeing it. And I think this is actually a really interesting debate to be had because some intrusive surveillance, like if it saves lives, might be okay. <laughs> right. And I mean, it's very interesting. You, so you see, you know, different countries take different approaches that I think are fascinating when you look at the trade-off they're doing between effectiveness and intrusiveness, right? So a little bit of surveillance is not effective. A lot is very effective, but it's also intrusive. So Singapore, for example, has this really interesting strategy where they created an app that people download to their phone. And then the app logs silently all the people you come within six feet of. And if you are tested positive, you can send an anonymous message to everyone in the past two weeks that you've been close to, to tell them, you know, go get tested. So I think that's really interesting, right? And there are ways of doing that, for example, like remote, you know, storage rather than cloud storage and that are actually not intrusive, but just effective. There are other ways that are very intrusive. Um, you know, you've seen some countries using literally just tracking data to go find people or, or, you know, reprimand them when they're not social distancing. And that I think makes a lot of people uncomfortable particularly if it's here to stay. I think even more unsettling <laughs> is the prospect of, um, a lot of people are saying that wearables um, or like, right, so wearable devices that for example, continuously track your temperature and your heart rate. Um, those could be widespread and used to make sure, for example, that you know if Google wants to have people work in person, but make sure that no one comes in that's sick, they could, put a wearable on all their employees and you know when you start getting a fever they'll email you saying don't come to work i would be uncomfortable with that um particularly because those biomarkers tell you much more than whether you're sick right your heart rate tells your mood and your excitement level and so i think those kinds of tracking well effective for the virus are going to be you know prompting a lot of questioning about what we're willing to trade for viral spread, right? What, how much of our privacy are we okay with giving up? This is true. It's always that back and forth. Edward Snowden. Okay. I'll just mention his name. He would care about this specifically, but yes. How much are you willing to put out there versus if it can be done anonymously, that's a nice feature, but how much of your information or even the community information is released outward? 
Yeah, well, Google's done some really interesting anonymous data um, releases with self-tracking data, just looking regionally, right, who is doing the best at social distancing. So they've anonymized the data and just put out summaries of, you know, in Alabama, they're not distancing, but in, you know, I don't know, California, they are. And I think that, you know, is aimed to kind of help policymakers, uh, you know, see, like, do a temperature check, pun intended, <laughs> of where their, uh, where their populations are and how much more enforcement they need. Right. To watch at steps, Google does. These big companies are able to do. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg talked about this. Large companies have the ability to do a lot, but then sometimes they don't care as much about specific detailed things. And then individuals have the ability to do, uh, have the care to do the little things, and sometimes don't have the ability yet to do the large things. But they uh, switch back and forth between those. Now, one other element you included: after an initial wave of isolationism, multilateral cooperation may flourish. How would this occur? What kind of flourishing can we expect? So, I mean, I'm an optimist. Um, and I, I actually, I actually don't think the hope is misguided, right? I think the nature of 21st century technologies, right, be they radioactive plants or viruses or, you know, a super advanced AI, if those are released accidentally, it's everyone's problem, right? There is no border or army that's going to hold off the consequences of those kinds of threats. And I think something like the coronavirus proves that, right? And proves that no country, you know, no matter how strong, can protect itself by acting alone. And, you know, humans are flawed for sure, but we do have this animal will to survive. <laughs> so I think that, you know, even though you're going to see a wave of isolationism in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, I think in the medium or longer term, countries are just gonna you know, be pragmatic and realize that the only way to protect themselves and their citizens and you know, their health and their wealth, right, not create their economies, is to cooperate and to act together and to have coordinated responses, monitoring systems, you know, response plans and contingency plans to make sure that the damage done to everyone is minimized. Mm -hmm. Let's say like a few years from now, looking back to this moment, how do we look at it? Do we look at it like, oh, remember that time? That was funny. Or like, that was the beginning of something that kept going, like little elements kept showing up. Yeah, I think it, I think it depends how far off you go. I mean, this is, it's so unprecedented and, and crazy just historically, right? To have the entire world focused on one thing at once. I mean, literally every populated area of the world right. focused on the same problem and like not doing anything. It's nuts. Um, but, uh, but I think, I think we're gonna look back on a lot of what we did before and find it crazy, right? Like I can't imagine myself going into a meeting and shaking 10 people's hands, right? Maybe, maybe we'll go back to it, but I doubt it. I think a lot of our awareness of our health and of bacteria and viruses, I think that's gonna stick. And I think we're gonna look back on this moment and on especially what preceded it as totally crazy. <laughs> um, I also think, I mean, I hope that countries will look back on this crisis and it's been interesting to see especially in the u.s the state-by-state -state approach that's been taken to tackling the virus right and some states who socially distanced early and who had really strong measures before the, the critical phase had arrived like california did really well right and other states that did not socially distance did very poorly and i think i hope people will look at that and it'll underscore the importance of just competence in government Right, I think in the US there's been this escalating cycle of polarization where you know basically people want like showmanship and partisan gratification and I think have a reflexive kind of disdain for experts. Um, and I hope that we'll look back and on the crisis as you know the time that everyone woke up and you know we're shaken back to demanding more from their government than just that showmanship and actual you know competence. Mm -hmm. Recent guest of mine, Peter Coleman from Columbia University, is writing an upcoming book about the polarization and how it has increased in the recent years. And he's very focused on conflict and the, how it's not functional in most cases. And if there was some sort of peace, then there could be forward progression. One thing that comes to mind is that this moment has illuminated a lot. It shows like what each country's different response is people around you, your community, your mayor, the governor, whatever, who, what kinds of illuminations have you seen specifically maybe in your region 
or that came to mind that it showed you this about this government or this about this group of people? Were there any things that come to mind there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's been very illuminating. That's a loaded question, a lot, lot to say. I mean, politically, um, I think it's been interesting to compare Canada to the US. Canada has been incredibly united in its response and incredibly kind of positive and we're all on the same team and you know everyone there's tremendous buy-in for social distancing Canada you know is so Quebec the province I'm from is the number one in North America on social distancing we've reduced retail and entertainment traffic by like 80 percent um so there's a certain pride I think in Canada in that unity um I think in the U.S. I've been surprised by the degree to which many Republicans were willing to ignore the science in ways that seemed clearly just self-defeating. Um, and I was surprised by how long they remained kind of blind to what was the scientific consensus before finally, you know, late to the party doing the, uh, putting some measures in place. So that's been a little dispiriting, but hopefully people will learn their lessons. Um, I personally have been illuminated by realizing that, you know, you really don't need to work as many hours as you do when you're going to the office. I think that, you know, working at home in kind of a flow state and in chunks of, you know, three, four hours accomplishes more than I have in many days at the office. So that's been a welcome realization and something I'm excited to continue doing, at least partially after the crisis. I have talked many times about flow and momentum and the high value of them specifically to me and some people maybe to yourself, those moments you get more done in like an hour than you can do sometimes in two days of whatever this, that, the other thing. What is it about Quebec that makes it advantaged in responding to a scenario in a way that seems more practical than maybe some other regions of the world? Well, it's cold. <laughs> so <laughs> there's less of an incentive to go outside. No, I mean, I'm, it is cold, but I think it's primarily like a political Canada has very different politics in the US. Um, and I think we have much more faith in experts. And you know, if you have an expert saying one thing and a politician saying another, I think people will generally listen to the expert in, in Canada. Um, and the business community in Canada, I think is much more like uh, solidarily aligned with the government. Um, right? Big companies tend to you know, check in a lot with them and, and there isn't as much polarization. So I think there was a very clear message going out to people um, and a very clear explanation of why those had to be done. And there was really no voice contradicting that, right? We didn't have anyone as there was in the US saying, you're overreacting, this is crazy, right? It really was kind of a unified message across political parties and, and you know, news anchors and all that. Huh. That must have been different. The news must have sounded different, frankly, if I think about it, because over here there was like a Right, there were two sides to the argument, whereas here it was really unified. It was just like, this is a thing, we're going to respond to it. I guess they could look like that somewhere on this planet, interestingly enough. Now, the article you wrote was in the business segment of Medium. Business is something you have focused on. Uh, how important is it that it just goes and they take as much risk as possible and that the government or uh, people are the brakes for their progress or should business self so yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of two parts to what you're saying. The first is, you know, I think, you know, as long as they're not breaking the law, I think taking risk is great, right? Capitalism is very wealth generating and I, and I support it. I do think there's irony to, you know, the equity holders in this crisis asking the government to bail them out, right? They took the gamble and they took the risk and there was a very high upside, but they didn't get lucky. And I don't think there is really any justification for, providing bailouts that will mainly benefit, you know, private equity firms and big hedge funds and family offices. Like they're fine. They're, you know, not going to starve. And they took the risk. And if they had gotten lucky, they would have gotten the upside. But the way capitalism works is that, you know, there are both winners and losers and taxpayers shouldn't be bailing out these people. Um, now to your point about kind of the broader issue of like how much regulation is appropriate. It's a really tough question. Um, I am generally averse to, industries being regulated in the minutia by people who don't understand them. Um, and I think it's very difficult to find lawmakers who have kind of intimate knowledge. I think certain, I actually think like antitrust enforcement is often a better solution. So if you have one big company, you have to regulate everything they do, 
Whereas if you can split up the companies, companies that treat their customers poorly, or, you know, they can, they'll just die out, right? Customers have options. So I think giving the market options and robust antitrust enforcement can often be a substitute to strict conduct-based regulation. Um, but I think, you know, anything that concerns kind of the environment or consumer protection, like those things are very important, right? Any industry where you have a vulnerable party, I think you should. So, you know, landlord tenant laws, consumer protection, because, you know, you don't read terms of service. Um, I think those are really important. But in, you know, con contracts between sophisticated parties, I think as long as, you know, they understand what they're doing and they're not being tricked and the words say what they mean, then I don't think you should interfere. Right. That makes sense. Antitrust, that's relevant. I, I watched a lot of uh, interviews and videos with like Bill Gates or yeah, responding at a deposition or it's nice to see business individuals defend their company in a way in that regard. Right. One other thing that came to mind re regarding Quebec is uh, similar to, I think, I believe yourself, a lot of people there speak English and French and yes. maybe another language. How does this um, benefit people in the region? Is there some... Um, mindset that comes with knowing more languages and does it make a person more globally connected that's a really that's a really interesting question um i think i, I do speak uh, many languages i grew up going to school in french um but you know speaking english with uh many of my peers and friends so i always kind of lived a both Eng anglophone and francophone life one of my favorite studies is of bilingual children and, you know, people say, oh, it's great to teach kids more than one language, but I'd never really seen the evidence of why. And it turns out that one of the most pronounced traits of kids that speak two languages is that they develop the ability for empathy way before their peers. And the reason is that when you're a kid who speaks more than one language, you learn pretty quickly that not everyone else understands what you understand, right? You can't speak French to someone you know who only speaks English. And that activity of forcing the kid to put themselves in someone else's shoes and think, okay, what language do I speak now? Apparently really accelerates that development and allows them to, you know, adopt other people's perspectives really early. Mm. That takes me, I talked to neurologist Alan Ropper at Harvard and he, Harvard Medical, and he talked about how, we were talking about how theory of mind develops around age five, six, seven, where you figure out that somebody else That's is not right. you and yeah. you're not them. And it sounds like that specifically fast exactly. forwards that you have no choice but to fast forward it when you're like, they don't even speak or I don't speak their language yeah, or something. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. That's a nice concept. Long live building empathy, a very important value. What <laughs> are three important values to you in people that you work with or meet or get to know? And then also adding on to that, uh, three uh, values you identify with as you yourself. They That's could a be great the same. Question. I don't know if it's a great question. I think that's great. So people I work with, I mean, probably most important would be, I like working with people that are really passionate about what they're doing, right? And aren't doing it as an obligation, but really like, you know, are psyched to come into work. <laughs> um, and I think that passion often, you know, makes them the best of what they do. So I find that, you know, I don't want to work with someone that's great if they're not enjoying themselves. Um, and I've always been really lucky to, find like the complex work I've done really fascinating and intricate and kind of intrinsically satisfying. And I like to work with people that share that. Um, so the second I think would be candor, right? I like people that are straightforward and honest and you know, don't like dance around and just kind of communicate really clearly. So I think, and that also just makes working much better, right? If you can get across your point really easily and you, you can work through things much more quickly and effectively. Um, and I like working with people that are funny. I think, right, if they're passionate, they're probably great. With it. I mean, that's obviously a, like, threshold is I like working with people that are very effective and, and you know, top of their field. But I think working with people that are funny just makes everything better. Yeah. When, when you're describing those, sometimes I think about the alternatives, like the person who is not excited about what they do. That's just not enjoyable all day. The person who is not direct, time just passes and you didn't get anywhere. And the person who's not maybe funny or in a joyful demeanor, you're not seeing them at their active mind portion. You're seeing sort of a dulled form. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know. I, I, maybe this is just the work I do, which can be a little dry, right? I think you have to have a sense of humor about things. That's true. Mm -hmm. Textbooks of law, 
are somewhat dry and no one is casually reading them. I love them. You love them. <laughs> <laughs> we have found the one person. It was actually a search. We're doing a detective documentary to find the one person on the planet who likes the content in uh, legal textbooks. We've located her. Okay. I want to point out, I always think of words and anagrams and letters. It's sort of like a 44444 four, 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 Emma, Rose, Bien, good, venue, almost like menu, but venue, like a place. It's like so four, 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 four. actually means welcome. Right. I was yeah. thinking of that. I knew it was something. So I'm literally welcome everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice feature. That's good. My name is the, cap, the first uh, part of a country, Armenia. So I have a country named Ethan. What is, I always like to check this one. What is one message you would want to let the whole globe know? You are globally minded. What would you want to let all people of the planet know that is important to you or that is something you'd want them to know for their life? What would you say if you had a megaphone to all 7.8 billion people on the planet? I mean, that's a loaded question. I'd want to give that one some thought, but maybe off, so, the, top, off the top of my head, like, I, think, I think many people don't realize how changeable their circumstances are, right? I think many people think they have to live with things that they don't like, but you can literally do whatever you want. Like you want to move to Texas and open a restaurant, like you can do that if you put your mind to it. You want to become a lawyer when you're 60, like you can do that also, go to law school. And I think, you know, inertia is hard, but I, and people, you know, can get stuck in routines that they don't enjoy. But I think it's important to, to remind, you know, yourself and your loved ones and kind of anyone you meet that, you know, if you don't like something, don't do it. And if you want to do something, just get up and start. What a great message there. There's no, the limitation is the opposite. This one is I can do things. Life is a, a moment for us to do. That's true. I like that message. Emma, I will, on this episode, we'll go ahead and close up the shop. I want to thank you for having been on episode 261 of the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Wonderful. That is great. And we are out.